Thank you guys all for coming out to the uh, Wanderlust School of Transgressive Placemaking. We're really grateful to uh, Acme Studio for this really beautiful studio. And we're really grateful to Derby, who's manning the bar. And Derby also built this beautiful set. And uh, now I'd like to introduce our sponsors, uh, Atlas Obscura. Here's Dylan Thurs. Uh, this around. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, so uh, in case you don't know, uh, my name is Dylan Thuris. I run a website called Atlas Obscura. Uh, online, we're a database, a compendium of wondrous and amazing places that you can check when you're traveling or see what's around you here in New York. Uh, we also put on a series of events uh, under the guise of the Obscura Society. So we do that here in New York, we do that in LA, we do that in San Francisco uh, all year round. And one of the things that we've been really lucky to do is have Nathan uh, and Ina as in residency uh, at Alice Obscura. So as Wanderlust, they are um, helping us put on some incredible events here in New York, including this series of talks on trespassing and safety, legality, and eventually design and documentation. Um, so yeah, I think this talk is particularly of interest uh, because there's that moment um, when you're planning to do something complicated and you know maybe questionable where you say, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if we you know strung rope bridges from, from rooftop to rooftop and, and had people go across them. And, and assuming you know, you've know you got your safety checked out, that was last week's talk, uh, there's that moment when you say, right, I'm pretty sure that this is totally illegal. Uh, and everyone goes, oh yeah, like, how illegal do you think this is? <laughs> and everyone ponders for a while and you, well, we'll never know. And then you just go, yeah. And so there's sort of this gap between artists and smart lawyers uh, who can give you good advice about this kind of stuff. Um, so without further ado, I'm thrilled to, to turn it over to uh, Patricia and Wiley to, to tell us uh, how illegal is it. Um, so here you go. Unless, yeah. So right, this week's talk is trespassing in the law. Go directly to jail. Do not pass go. You can give me $200. Um, we're really excited to have you guys help us remake and reimagine the far side of the no trespassing sign. And to talk about that today, we have, well first I have to say, Ida Benedetto is not with us today. She's in Uganda doing a top secret project. She'll be back for next week's uh, talk. Uh, so in her place, to help me wrangle all you guys and keep things in line, I have the journalist Beckett. And we have a uh, civil rights lawyer and man about town, Wiley Stecklo. And Patricia Wright, who among many other things, uh, was an assistant, as a former assistant DA in the really grand place of the Bronx. After you come out of the Bronx, you can probably handle just about anything. <laughs> All right, uh, Wiley and Patricia are going to uh, talk about a few different things first. They're going to kind of give us a rundown of, of some legal stuff, and then we're going to open it up and have a kind of free-for-all. And I know you guys have a lot of questions, and i got a couple questions to it, so we'll just have a big discussion. Um, who wants to start it off first? Uh, Good evening, everybody. Hello. Hello. Um, so we're really excited to be here. Patricia and I want to thank for having us and tell me if you can't hear me. Um, so the history of trespass basically involved three distinct types of trespass. Trespass to person, which is what we now know as like assault and battery type of claims. Trespass to chattel or goods or personal property, which is you know, taking people's stuff. And trespass to land, which is sort of what we now commonly refer to as trespass. Um, you know, in a six word definition, Trespass is a wrongful interference with one's possessory rights. And obviously the social function of trespass law is to guarantee private property both by providing a remedy for interference with possession 
as well as by enabling those with greater rights uh, of possession to recover land from the occupiers with less interest. Um, there's what I would imagine in these, this day and age, I'm going to turn over to Trish in a second to talk more about the specifics of the New York trespass law. Um, ordinarily, in the trespass law, in the criminal aspect, there are three basic defenses to trespass. And that's that you had a license to be there. Somebody with authority said, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's justification by law. Sometimes that could be the police who break into a house because something's going on or a 911 call came. Ordinarily, that'd be a trespass, but they have the legal authority to be there. There's a necessity justification, which is a specific uh, statute and affirmative defense in the state of New York, which never works, but you have to actually file a motion before trial to try and bring it. And we did that once about a year ago, a year and a half ago for Reverend Billy, and uh, he had brought his choir to Bank of America, I believe, uh, on 6th Avenue to one of the big commercial buildings there on November to stop shopping day or the black day or whatever the day he wanted to call that. The idea was that they were gonna go around and try and get people not to go shopping on the big shopping day of the year. There was amazing video of the choir with angel uh, wings coming into the bank lobby and circling around and singing and because it was the day before Thanksgiving or the day after, there was not a lot of people in the building but the security was freaking out and trying to usher them out of the building as they kept flurrying about and flurrying about and breaking into song. And, you know, they eventually all left and then doing what they shouldn't be doing, which is afterwards, if you've done something that you shouldn't have done, don't hang out and wait right in front of where you did it. Because like 20 minutes later, the cops roll up and arrest him. Nobody else, just him. And so we went to trial on that particular arrest and the, we wanted to go with the necessity defense, the idea that he was doing this to bring attention to, at that time, it was coal top mountain removal. So we, mountain top removal coal mine. So we were trying to bring attention to that, and so we, we filed this long motion with the court. We were gonna go with justification by necessity because if he doesn't do this, if he doesn't break this small crime of trespass, he could possibly stop this larger pollution and, and murder and killing by these different banks and then the funding they were doing for this. And of course the, uh, the judge said, no, you can't present that defense. So instead we went with the facts and we actually won that case and that we were not guilty. <laughs> so if you ever ask him, he'll be very happy to tell you how guilty he was <laughs> when he was found not guilty. So th those are sort of the basic defenses you can try and use for trespass. I'm gonna pass over to Patricia now to talk more about the elements and the, uh, the actual crime of trespass in New York State. So uh, the first uh, element of trespass, uh, we have a trespass. Okay, so we have a trespass violation, trespass in the third degree, and trespass in the second degree. Of course, is trespass in the first degree, which we won't even talk about because you all uh, don't intend to uh, incur uh, felony charges. So that's that's the first degree. Um, so a trespass violation is when someone knowingly enters um, or remains unlawfully upon a premises. Um, and that can be a building, that can be a piece of property, any, any piece of land uh, that has, uh, that someone else has a possessory right to. Um, the uh, trespass in the third degree, a person is liable for trespass in the third degree when he or she knowingly um, enters or remains unlawfully in a building um, or, or a piece of real property of another. The, the, the main element uh, to make it into a third degree trespass is uh, that the person went into a building. Now, the, the, the main thing is that it's it's got to be enclosed in such a way or uh, signs posted uh, that clearly communicate that this is a piece of private property that you're not allowed to be on. Um, so uh, it, it, the uh, third degree further breaks it down uh, for uh, an elementary or a secondary school. Of course, you want to protect children. You don't want people coming onto the, onto the property or a public housing project. Um, and then uh, that is actually a B misdemeanor. Um, B misdemeanor is uh, punishable by up to 30 days in jail. And the A misdemeanor is trespass in the second degree. Uh, that's when you uh, enter or remain unlawfully in a dwelling uh, or a secondary school or, uh, or if you're convicted of a sex crime. And I'm sure that you uh, wouldn't want to be going on to a piece of property if you have something like that uh, in, your, in your background. 
what I wanted to get into also was the, uh, the difference between uh, criminal liability and civil liability. Um, with criminal liability, it's, it's uh, strictly defined, strictly con construed, uh, where you actually have to intend to go onto the piece of property and you know that it's not uh, a piece of property that's, that's your own. It has to be clearly communicated, like I said. Civil, civil liability is just entering onto a piece of property regardless of intent. Um, so, as widely said, there are uh, various um, ways that you can get around it. But one thing that he didn't say is uh, if there's a piece of unimproved land, if you have an open field, a piece of unimproved land that doesn't have any fencing or any signs whatsoever, um, you have pretty much can prove in court that you know you didn't have the proper notice in order to go onto the land. Um, let's see what else I have here. I have all of these notes that I made for this. Um, Let me just add to what you just said. The, the specific aspect of that is the knowing requirement. In the law, you have something called mens rea, which is really the, the, the knowledge, the mental knowledge you have when you're committing any type of crime. And so there are certain crimes that you can commit recklessly, which means I didn't mean to do it, but you were so outrageous in your conduct you did it. Or you could do it intentionally, which means you knew what you were doing and you intended to do it. For trespass, they are knowing crimes. So if you read the definition of the first element of most of the trespass is knowingly enters or remains. So when you're talking about a piece of land like that, that has no fencing and there's no notice, you didn't know you were in violation. Now if somebody walks up to you and says, this is my land, you cannot be here, you must leave, then you might be you know, now knowingly remaining there and therefore it's unlawful. But I think that's, that's sort of part of where you're at. Right, right, and then as someone who has the authority to say, hey, you're not allowed to be on this property. Um, there's, there's also, uh, Quasi-public uh, quasi areas, there's, we have a question already. Sorry, can you just speak more to the mic? Yes, thing? absolutely. Yes, I, I okay. So uh, we have uh, also quasi-public areas. So these are areas where, um, so for instance, if I own a shop and I have, um, you know, like a, a lobby area in my shop, uh, that's that's technically a quasi-public area. I'm, I'm, I'm inviting people to come in to this area for the purpose of, of, of conducting business. It can be a parking lot in a shopping mall area. It can be um, uh, the, the area outside of uh, Acme Studios, uh, right, in, right inside the garage area. People, where, where people come, uh, it looks like a loading dock, uh, come to conduct business. Um, so the, the point with that is, that if you enter and you're not sure, because maybe it's quasi-public so you're allowed to be there, that's okay. But if they then tell you you're no longer allowed to be here, we're removing your permission. Remember we talked a little bit about license being a defense. Someone gave you permission to be there. In a quasi-public space, that's sort of like open license. It's a store, I entered, I'm allowed to be here. Until they say, you're no longer allowed, I'm taking that license away. Now if you remain unlawfully, that's the or part of the statute. It's no uh, entering or remaining unlawfully. So you entered lawfully, but you're now remaining unlawfully, so you can still be prosecuted for one of the different aspects of trespass. Mark, did you have a question? Oh, I have a question about, so you've got to talk about the window, so you can come back to this, for example. That's not like the sidewalk in front of the Well, uh, that's public. That's public area. Can but you repeat the question, please? Sure. The question was trying to distinguish between the loading dock in front of the Acme uh, Theater entrance and the sidewalk in front of the loading dock. And what would the sidewalk be quasi-public? And I think Patricia and I agree that that would be public space. So it, it, you likely could not be prosecuted for being there unless something was going on, there was construction or a movie set or something where the city had given license to somebody to control that and you refused to leave. However, if you do pro protest in a public area such as the sidewalk and you're impeding the flow of traffic or making, making it hard for people to get into the businesses up, up and down the sidewalk, then you can be uh, technically arrested for trespass as well. Let, let's actually hold off on the questions for a minute and, and let's get all the way through um, talking about, you know, what you can expect if you get arrested and a couple of that. Let's just work through that real quick and then we'll just go straight to all questions. Remember your question, hang on to that. Okay, um, so I'm going to just run through this really quickly. There's um, uh, something called a divorce. 
work standards. Uh, there was a, uh, this guy named DeBoer, he was walking down the street late one night in uh, 1976, December 7th. He was just walking down the street and uh, he crosses the street when he sees the police coming. He claimed he didn't see the police. The police uh, then cross the street and, and confront him and they say, um, you know, hey, uh, can, we, can I look inside your jacket? Um, and he happened to have a gun on him. Um, and <laughs> so, so this case spawned the um, levels uh, of, of police encounter uh, that you can expect. Uh, so the first level is um, uh, objective, credible reason. Approach to it. So the police can approach and ask you questions. Uh, you know, hey, where are you going tonight? Um, what, what it, what it, where are you coming from? Uh, it can't be a very intrusive questioning um, as to your your activities and your and your whereabouts. Um, and, and at that level, you actually don't have to respond. Exactly. You can you just walk, walk away. away. And if you don't feel comfortable, you can say, Hey, um, am I being investigated? Am I under arrest? No. Okay. And walk away. Um, second level, uh, founded suspicion. So say something happens, there's a burglar alarm that, that's, that's uh, ringing and then uh, you happen to be jogging away from that general area, the officers can, can stop you and, and ask, you know, what's, what's going on with this. Um, uh, they can make you feel like you're being investigated, but you still have the right to walk away if they don't actually have any information on you or or uh, any reason to believe that you're the one who actually committed the crime. Um, but at and, this point, you are actually more obligated to respond to their questioning because it's correct. a different level. And the third level is uh, reasonable suspicion. So say someone said, hey, that guy in the green shirt, uh, I saw him you know, running from that building and some lady was screaming after him and she had blood all over her and she looked like she was hurt. Then the police officers have the right to stop you and actually you know, detain you and ask questions, and if you don't want to ask questions, uh, answer the questions, then uh, you can you can actually be detained and, and taken down to the police precinct. Um, they also have the right to, quote unquote, stop and, and, and frisk you for safety. They're not necessarily looking for anything in particular, but if they're going to arrest you, they want to look for things uh, that uh, are harmful to them, harmful to yourself, or harmful to the other people who you're going to be in the cell with. Um, or the police precinct with, and the fourth level is, is probable cause. Um, in my experience, police officers generally just jump to the, the, the third level. Um, this, they'll say something like, oh yeah, we saw a bulge in this person's pocket, and you know, we, we stopped and frisked him for my safety. Uh, so, um, so after you've been, you know, you're supposed to be gone through these steps, um, you're, and, and you're actually arrested, you're taken down to the police precinct where they um, pretty much process you. They get your pedigree information um, and they uh, get approval from their sergeant as to the charges that they're going to charge you with. Um, and then you go down to central booking, which isn't a very pleasant place at all. It's, uh, it's, it's filled with uh, people of all walks of life. Um, <laughs> From from uh, the, the the term they call is uh, skells, uh, you know people people who uh, you know live live on the street, you know don't shower at all, who, who have mental issues, uh, and all the way to doctors and lawyers who've been arrested for DUIs or whatever other whatever other issues. Um, so what they do is they they ask you uh, who. Do you expect to come to your arraignment? Um, how long you've been living at your current residence? Um, they ask you uh, what your current job is, how much money you're receiving. This is this is all um, uh, going to what's called the, the criminal justice agency, and what they're doing is they're trying to determine um, how likely you are to come back to court in your next court date if you don't actually get rid of your case. So once you are uh, gone through that process, you're ready to see the judge, and one of two things can happen. You can either plead the case out. A lot of people like to do that because um, once I tell them how long it takes to actually get to a trial, they're just like, oh my god, I can't keep coming down to court. Um, so you can, uh, if you don't have a criminal record, if, if you uh, are 
uh, if you have a relatively minor charge on you, you can either plea it out to an, uh, what's called an adjournment in contemplation of dismissal or, or a violation or something lesser than what you've been charged with in order to get rid of the case. You can probably do something like community service or, um, or social services if you're caught with drugs or something along those lines. Um, and then that case is over. Or you can go on a trial and come back to court several times uh, before you actually see a trial, uh, which a lot of people don't like. But that's, that's generally it. Just stepping back for one second. At the time of the arrest, you know, for let's assume this is a trespass situation that people are caught. Um, let's, let's go with their caught in a place they're not supposed to be above ground, you know, in, in you know, a, a public, in a city owned property. Uh, and the police come upon you and they're gonna say, what are you doing here? Right, so this is now one of those three or four levels that the board uh, is out there that Patricia explained. And at that point, because you're probably where you're not supposed to be, you're not at level one, right? You can't just walk away. You can try. Sorry, officer, sorry, we didn't know, we, we don't understand. We're, can we go home now? Can we just leave? That might work, you know, if you're nice and you're sweet and you smile and they're having a, a good night and they're not looking to hit their quota, that might actually work. The other thing is it might not, and they want to see your ID, they want to run and see if you're wanted for anything, and that's more likely. But they'll ask some question, what are you doing here? You should have some good response. We're here because we thought this was our mother's house. We, you know, we read about this on the internet, thought this was legal, that we're allowed to come here and look around. Stuff like that. And they'll say, well, let me see an ID. And at this point, they're probably within their rights to ask you for an ID. And I'd suggest you give it to them with a smile because they're now controlling the next 24 hours of your life. So you want to give them the ID, and you want to be the nicest thing you can for them. You don't want to threaten them with a lawsuit. You want to tell them, do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? Like, none of that stuff's going to work in that moment. You want to ask them, oh, did you hear about the Yankees today? You know, whatever you can connect with with them that is away from the situation at hand. Hopefully you have no warrants out for you. When I say that, most people here will say, oh, I, I don't really have a warrant. You'll be really surprised about how many people have gotten a ticket or a summons for drinking on the street, for playing a radio too loud, for public urination or other stupid things that they forget about or they don't go to court for. And nothing really happens with that. It's not the same database as the criminal docket, right? It's no one's gonna come out and arrest you for that. However, if the police stop you and they run your ID, that's when they're gonna arrest you. Now they're gonna say, Aha, uh -huh, we hit a warrant. They never showed up for that drinking ticket. Now you're going through the system. Now you go through the process Patricia described. You're no longer able to talk your way out of it. You're no longer eligible for what's a, called a desk appearance ticket or summons. So my first bit of advice to anybody is, if that's ever happened to you and you forgot or you're not sure, go to whatever that court is and show up one morning. Go, go plan to have the day and go there and say, I think in 2005, I got a ticket that I didn't take care of. Can you check for me? And they're, not, they're likely not to arrest you on the spot if it pops, because you're there surrendering. And they'll, even when it does pop, you know, if they had caught you, and they bring you, usually the judge throws them all out anyway. It's just more record keeping than anything else, but they will take you if it pops, the police will take you and put you in overnight, no questions asked. So let's say they take your ID, they run it, nothing pops, we're in good shape. Right? So now the police are deciding, are we going to arrest them or not? Are we going to let them go? Because of the way the, the current what, situation... What happens in that moment if you don't have your ID on you or you pretend you don't have your ID or something like that? Bad idea. <laughs> Bad <laughs> idea because the police at that point have the absolute right to take you in and fingerprint you to find out if you're a mass murderer. <laughs> so... You know, I don't suggest you do that. I don't suggest you give a fake name. I don't, all of those things in that moment, that moment you're trying to get out from where you are and you don't want to dig yourself any deeper. Now at the same point, if he says, do you have any drugs on you? Then maybe you don't answer straight to him. I don't, I don't think you should lie to him, but I would try and avoid the question, avoid the answer. You know, here's my ID officer. I asked you if you had any drugs on you. Well, here's my wallet officer, you know. See what you can do. Um, you know, because honestly, at that point, if you say, sure, I have some marijuana in my pocket, when you're going to court the next morning after this whole process, in court, they're going to read out loud. And at the arrest, the defendant stated, I have marijuana in my pocket. And every time. 
And even if you say 13 things before, my brother gave me a pocket, it was his jeans, and it was my uncle, and, was, and there's marijuana in my pocket. All they're gonna read is, there's marijuana in my pocket. So that, in that way, I would say don't necessarily give them the ID, give them that, but that's one of those questions where if you can avoid answering, I would avoid answering. Um, so now, if you're there, you wanna remember summons DAT. Those are the things you want to remember when the officer is talking to you and he's taking your ID. Officer, can you please give me a summons? Can I go home or can you give me a summons? Because those can be written on the spot. Those, there's no photograph, there's no fingerprinting. They write them on the spot. You leave, they leave. You go to 346 Broadway some months in the, in the future and a judicial hearing officer without the district attorney even present will bring you up and say, $25 fine, okay, okay, go. You know, it's gonna be a morning of your, your life that'll be done, but that's it. And that's really what your hope is. Summons is the next best thing to saying go home now. Uh, and the summons are like a pink piece of paper, like parking tickets. Other than that, you can ask for a desk appearance ticket. That's a little heightened about where you'll be in the process. At that point, they would take you to the precinct. They would likely photograph you and fingerprint you. But then they don't wait for the fingerprints to come back with your record. At that point, they give you a ticket. It's now a full eight and a half by 11 white piece of paper. And it has on the other date you're supposed to come back to court. Now you're going to real criminal court where there'll be district attorneys, but you're still in the low level of crimes or violations or offenses. And they don't run the paperwork until after you leave. There's a 50-50 chance they'll never run the paperwork. The folder will fall behind the heater. The, there'll be a different crime that comes in. Somebody will go out and get coffee and they'll spill, I mean, who knows why? I'd say my experience is you'll go into the DAT date that you're supposed to go in, and there's a list of people, the paperwork's just not ready, they give you a standardized piece of paper saying, hi, thank you for coming today. Here's a phone number to call because your paperwork wasn't ready. Call us in 30 days because maybe it'll be ready then. If not, don't worry about it. And that's it. You know, and so it it's, it's, those are the two ways. The summons and the DAT are almost as good as just walking home that night. The other part is getting processed overnight, and that's the part Patricia described very well. You know, you go through this, it's, the law now is, because there was some litigation over 24 hours from arrest to arraignment. Now that doesn't mean at 24 hours and 30 minutes you go free. That means at 24 hours and 30 minutes, a lawyer has the right to go to a different court and file an order to show cause to get you released, which will take six to seven hours to just do that. That only really happens when there's, say, 30 people arrested at a mass protest that the DA's office and the police are messing with by holding them for too long. Then someone will go into federal court and get them out. But otherwise, it's all the 24 hour rule really does is make sure it happens fast. So 24 hours being fast in their minds. So that's not 48 for the most part. Let me just jump in quickly. How do you judge whether an officer will react favorably to you being like, give me a summit? Like, is that something that everyone's gonna be like, uh, appreciate? Or will some people maybe first look back? Do you have uh, experience? Thankfully, no personal experience. Um, but I mean, it's everybody here, I assume, lives in New York or spends time in New York in, in the five boroughs. And I think that just life experience of interaction with people gives you an idea. Is this person so aggravated and so angry that not, this is only going to make it worse? Or is he like, you know, is he sort of smiling or does he have a lighter air about him? So I can say to him, officer, any chance this is a summons sort of offense? I mean, there are patrol guidelines, part of the NYPD, that talks about when DAT are eligible and when they're not. And it's mostly violent offenses, family offenses, prior warrants, all that makes you ineligible for a desk appearance ticket. So you may not be eligible. I don't know what's gonna pop on your, your what, what you'll be charged with or what will be in your history, but ask. Ask for the summons, ask for the DAT, ask in a sweet, nice way. I tell clients, I mean, I do these talks once a month in Harlem about uh, Know Your Rights, and we tell people all the time, if you want to stand up in an officer's face because you're right and they're wrong, go for it. But realize that's going to put you on this side, and you're likely to spend the night in jail, and then we'll deal with it thereafter. If you want to go home to your family that night, step over here. You're going to give up some of your rights. You may have to show them an ID when you don't have to. You may not be able to walk away when you're supposed to, but that way you get to go home that night. So it's sort of or, or the officer might be might have a quota. Uh, they go into the uh, precinct in the morning or at the beginning of their shift, and their sergeant does roll call, and they say, "Okay, well, you're supposed to have this many arrests." So they could be very happy, or they could be very angry. 
but they have to make a certain amount of arrests. I mean, it's, it, it makes money for the city, uh, and uh, they they are treated favor more favorably uh, in, in the precinct if they, if they make as many arrests as they are asked to. And that's, that's something that came up in the most recent Floyd case, which is a stop and frisk trial that just ended, and the verdict hasn't come down yet from the judge. But this idea of quotas, or what the police call productivity goals, because quotas, <laughs> they recognize quotas are illegal, but productivity goals are allowed. But there, there's been great exposés in the Village Voice and the Daily News about the fact that at roll call, they'll say, I need 10 and 5, 10 and 30, I think something like that, where it's by the month and by the week. And so we get in our office, we do a lot of unlawful arrest litigation, we can see like, oh look, he was arrested on the 29th of the month, I wonder why. You know, the, the guy, had, the officer had to make a quota or else he was going to not get promoted or the sergeant was going to come down on him or his commanding officer was going to make his life more difficult. Does, does this mean that if you're planning shenanigans, <laughs> do it early in the month? Yes, yeah. actually. <laughs> try and talk your way out of it, and it's the 13th of the month, you're probably in better shape than it's the 28th of the month. And officers like overtime. They love overtime. So they're feeling like, okay, well, I'm going to make an arrest tonight because I want to make some more money. Then they'll do it. Are you ready for some questions? Hold tight. I think, I think Beckett's got a question for first. Up front, right here? Okay, we'll, we'll go with you first. So much love. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Would you just paint a scenario where you could be in a property that is not clearly defined as private? It's, it's underdeveloped, there's no fence, there's no sign. You're walking through that property, but you're about to be attacked, you're being shot, someone sits in the on you, or they jump out of a corner and they beat you. Who is liable in that scenario? You as a person who is on the property, unaware of that private property? Hang on one second, I just want to repeat the question. So the question is, uh, if you're on private property, or if you're on property where you don't know uh, whether it's private or what the situation is, and you, know, you think you have a right to be there, and you're attacked by someone who thinks that they're protecting their property or something like that, who's liable? Well, um, you would, if the landowner decided he wanted to sue you for you know, trespass on the owner, press charges against you criminally, he, he could do that, and that's that's a separate case. Uh, but then this person uh, isn't really justified in, in attacking you or, or causing you bodily harm, so that person would also have uh, criminal charges against them for, for assault. So in terms of liability, if they didn't properly uh, enclose the land or post signs up that said, this, this, this land is private property, do not come onto the land, then you know you 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 have uh, justification. You technically have a license to be on the property because they didn't tell you uh, that it's private property. What if it's a, a situation where maybe there's some fences, but fences are old and have a bunch of holes in them, and maybe you happen to wander through one of the holes in the fence? Uh, I think that this this is a very fact specific situation, and could even depend upon which which county you're in, you know, which police officer arrives. I mean, for the situation that you described. One officer could arrive and arrest the landowner. Another officer will arrive and arrest you. Somebody else may arrest both of you. And once that decision's made, it's gonna be extremely difficult to change it, to, to then you know, bring another criminal charge against somebody else. It doesn't stop you from any civil claims you may wanna pursue, but those criminal decisions are made by the officers usually on the scene, and once they're made, they're made. My recommendation is in that situation, you should hire uh, Patricia and Juan to represent. Right here. Um, so you guys sort of talked about the difference between public and private. And I was hoping you could enumerate that a little bit. Uh, uh, I, I guess, can you talk a little bit more about the distinction of if you're caught trespassing on somebody's private property versus uh, on a city property where you're supposed to be? And specifically, last week, Nathan and Ida were telling a story about being caught, almost caught, 
coming down the cables of the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, as you're walking down the Brooklyn Bridge or looking up the Brooklyn Bridge, there's no sign there that says no trespassing. <laughs> Are you telling me that they could argue that they didn't know that they weren't supposed to be climbing the Brooklyn Bridge on the cables because there's no sign? Do you want to repeat that or is that right? No. Did you want to hear that? <laughs> okay, so let's just start with could they argue that? You can argue anything. You know? <laughs> Would it work? I highly doubt it. You know, there's say you're arrested for that and you're now on trial. More than likely it would hope it would be an A misdemeanor so you'd get a jury trial. However, if it's a B misdemeanor, and oftentimes it's just the district attorney's office from the different boroughs like to play a game with criminal trials. And Patricia understands this well having come from one of them. On the eve of trial, they drop the A misdemeanor to a B misdemeanor and take away your right to a jury trial. So that argument, which you think might you might be able to sell to 12 jurors, 12 peers, is probably not going to fly with the judge. You know, they're just going to say, no, I don't believe that anybody thought that you're allowed to climb up the Brooklyn Bridge cables. Now, I represented some individuals who a couple of years ago did a, um, an art thing on the Williamsburg Bridge, you know, where they were hanging from... Aerial sales. There you go. <laughs> so, and they were arrested, and they were charged with reckless endangerment, not trespass, because they were saying you were being a danger to yourself, and to all the people below you, all the vehicles below you. Now these individuals had prepared without legal advice, but they actually did some intelligent things. A, I was able to prove to the DA, because this was not decided by a judge, we, we pitched the DA about getting a better plea than having them go to a felony. I wanted to bring it down to a violation, because there's different levels of crimes in New York State. We talked about the violation offense for trespass, and then you have the A and the B misdemeanor, and then you could have a felony. So felony obviously being the highest uh, charge, the highest type of crime, misdemeanor being a, a lower type of crime, and violations not being a crime at all. So that when you're dealing with people arrested in criminal court, the goal is usually to go to one level below. And if you get to a violation from somebody who's in a felony, that's a, that's a home run. Because you're taking them out of the felony world, out of the criminal world completely, and into a non-criminal disposition. So in the future, have you ever been convicted of a crime? You know, that question on an employment application? The answer is no, I was convicted of an offense. That's not a crime. So for this, this situation, we will convince the DA that they had planned this ahead of time, that they were well-versed and well-trained in safety for all the aerial knots and stuff they had to tie onto that. And that the spot they chose, they chose because it was not over a pedestrian pathway and was not over a roadway. And so, based on that, and based on some prior case law that we were able to show, the DA's office eventually, I mean, it took some time, but eventually they came back and gave us that non-criminal offense. So we went from felony, past misdemeanor, down to violation. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just uh, stay on this topic for a minute? Um, we talked about, okay, you've, you know, you've heard back from the court, you're trying to decide whether you're gonna be guilty or go to court and actually try this thing and you're getting a criminal misdemeanor, what do you do, how do you think through, what are the sort of factors that you should weigh in terms of your own background going forward, like how bad is a criminal misdemeanor? Um, can, you, can you repeat the question, how, how, how? Just, you know, say you are a lawyer for someone, they've been trespassing, it might be a criminal misdemeanor, how would you talk through with that person? You know, if somebody has no prior criminal record, my goal is to let them leave with no criminal record, and I work very hard to make sure that is the result. Um, sometimes I work too hard to even go below that to the ACD that we discussed earlier, which is you know, one step below the violation. That's ostensibly a dismissal. It's six months later, but it's ostensibly a dismissal. So if someone's arrested for a criminal trespass, the, the violation disposition is out there. I mean, it's what you can get if you work at it. Now, if you're represented by a public defender, they are overworked, overwhelmed, and understaffed and underpaid. So they're not bad lawyers, they're exceptional lawyers. But they're not gonna, they're not gonna care so much, because they can't, about whether you get a trespass misdemeanor or a trespass violation, because they're worried about whether this guy's going to jail for 25 years or eight years. And that's obviously a more important issue for them. So those are the individuals who are gonna come into my office and pay a private lawyer to handhold them 
and to put together a letter writing campaign or something that I can package together, sit down with the DA, and pitch them on why this shouldn't be a criminal record, it should be a non-criminal disposition. And, and if you don't have a, a prior criminal history, it's, it's more likely than not that you'll, you'll get a non-criminal disposition violation or uh, an ACD anyway. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you have something in, in your background, the, the DA is probably going to look at it and say, hey, well, you know, you're, you're, you're a troublemaker, and they'll, they're probably going to want to push for um, the, 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 at least the B misdemeanor. Um, and, you know, some people want to go to trial on the principle of it and, and try to see if they can either get a jury notification or, or uh, let's see if they can get the jury to uh, uh, just see what, they, see what they had to say or, or get the judge to dismiss it as well. That's also that that question whether to go to trial or not when you're facing a misdemeanor is the big right that's a sixty four thousand dollar question because on the one hand I have an offer of a violation a non criminal disposition you can walk away and say I've never been convicted of a crime on the other hand I can try this case I could go to trial and press my rights and say I did nothing wrong but I could end up with a criminal conviction and a criminal record and so that's why plea bargaining is what works out ninety something percent of the time because you'd rather know for sure, I'm gonna put in the bank that after this situation, I can go out and do my thing again, and that would maybe be the first time I get a criminal record, because this won't be, I won't have it on the record already. Right there? Yes, I have a question that, um, when back to combination of questions, where, what, is there an expectation of um, distance, or like, of you being able to see signs saying no trespass, like you went to it on the field, there's a sign on the other side of the field. Are you expected to, to research it all before walking into it? No. I mean, I'll, I'll give another example. Could you? Um, so the question is asking about trespassing signs. Sort of how much do you have to see? How much research do you have to do? Is just, if there is no obvious posted sign, can you say, like, I thought it was okay to go in there? Like, what, is, what are the levels and what are the level of uh, understanding you're supposed to have? I mean, when I say no, no, you will likely, if someone's going to come arrest you, they're going to arrest you. You can argue to a DA, you can argue to a judge or to a jury, I couldn't possibly have seen that sign. It wasn't posted, therefore, I didn't knowingly enter illegally. And maybe that will work. Uh, another example I can give is that uh, at the end of Wall Street, right before it gets to, what is that, whatever the Seaport Street is, there is uh, a little park on Wall Street. And it doesn't look like a park to me. It just looks like benches and a tr couple trees on the sidewalk. But apparently it's a park, and that the parks in New York City close at a certain hour. And so I had some Occupy clients who had just left WBAI at like 2 in the morning. The police decided to mess with them and said, you're in the park after closing, and we're going to give you a summons. Well, the sign is three blocks that way, or two blocks that way, or 200 yards that way. I entered out of this building here. There was no signage here. Now, we got the case dismissed, but they suffered the arrest. You know, had to deal with it. So it's that situation. Again, a lot of what happens here is who's on the scene, what's their motivation? Is it the end of the month? Are they light on their productivity goal? Is it coming down from the NYPD intelligence to mess with occupiers to try and show their First Amendment? You know, what's really going on? Is this, you're on a, you're on a private space that's not really well signed, but the owner's brother is a cop and he's the one talking to you right now. You know, a lot of it is very fact specific. So my question is, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so let's say you got charged with a felony. What happens? What? What are you going to? What is the repercussions of that? Uh, and then the other thing is, um, let's say you got charged for a lesser crime. What would that be? How much time would you have to serve? What would the cost be? And let's say you get out for with nothing. What would the cost of a lawyer be for that? So the question is, what's the real repercussions of a felony versus what kind of time are you going to serve for the stuff in the middle? And then what would it, what's it cost to get off with basically nothing? Right, and the, the real question back at you is, are we talking solely in a trespass scenario? Yeah. So if we're talking about just a regular trespass scenario, you're, you're not going to be charged with a felony. Um, at all, um, unless you've entered into a dwelling with a weapon, um, and that brings you over into the felony felony land. 
um, I'm, I'm sure that you're you're not thinking of it. Is that what you were thinking no. about? Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So, so no. I mean, uh, and 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 in terms of hiring an attorney, uh, that that all depends on the attorney. There are some high-powered attorneys that charge a thousand dollars an hour, and there's some that charge two hundred fifty dollars an hour. So it's it's up to you to go and find uh, which one is right for you. Let me give you some parameters to, to help you. First off, here, here's a definition of criminal trespass in the first degree, which is the felony trespass, right? And basically, it's a person is guilty of criminal trespass in the first degree when he knowingly enters or remains unlawfully in a building, and when in the course of committing such crime, he also, one, possesses or knows that another participant in the crime or in the trespass possesses an explosive or a deadly weapon, or possesses a firearm, rifle, or shotgun. You know, or knows that another per another participant in the trespass possesses a firearm, rifle, or shotgun. So first step is obviously if you guys are gonna go out and do some shenanigans, you realize that carrying explosive, anything that can be deemed an explosive device, or even, a weapon. Even things like fireworks or anything even remotely close to such a right. thing. Don't, don't give them Part of the pun, the ammunition <laughs> to raise the uh, the element up here. Now, as far as and I'll finish quickly, as far as pricing and costs, you know, private criminal attorneys, as Patricia said, are far ranging. You know, you can have some young attorneys who've just recently put out their own shingle, and their fees may be much more reasonable to an individual's um, pocket who isn't self wealthy, who isn't working on Wall Street, who isn't part of the one percent. You could also be, you know, Jay Z or Puff Daddy, who had a case, and hire Ben Brockman, who I think is one of the world's greatest criminal defense lawyers, but charges, you know, outrageously high fees. And I don't think he even charges hourly. I think he charges something like hundred thousand dollar flat for this, two hundred fifty thousand dollars for that. When I have somebody who comes into my office for a criminal case, I don't charge hourly. I try and give somebody a flat rate. And it's a flat rate. Here's what it is for everything up to uh, hearings and trial. And here's what it is if we have to go to hearings and trial. And depending on the relationship and the friend, you know, where they're coming in, or whether or not it's in Manhattan or Queens, which is Manhattan, very easy. Queens, a big pain in the butt. You know, I might say it's, I'll give you a lower number. And then that includes the first two appearances. And then it's X per appearance thereafter. And, you know, it, it can be, $1,500 for a DAT or a summons or something like that. If it's a summons and I know I'm gonna get in and out pretty quickly, I could, I've done it for friends for $500. You know, and that's a very low amount. It's, it's really just because you're my friend, I wanna help you. You're obviously not my best friend, because then I'm not charging $500, but you know, I want, you're, you're a friend, I wanna help you, but I need, I need to put, keep the lights on. Okay. Thank you. Have, uh, you're right here in the black. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see what color. Even the blue shirt first. All right, uh, can you talk about squatting? Like, what is legally? At what point does it not become squatting? Everything that you want to talk about squatting, can you talk about it? Um, we have some people in the audience who are interested in squatting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if With you were, the the way they are. if you were to enter into a New York City building that uh, hasn't been approved, that's that's boarded up. And uh, you stay there for uh, 10 years, and you hold this place out to be your own. You receive mail there. You somehow get the lights on. Uh, it's yours after 10 years. Uh, that's that's the law in, in New York. Hopefully, the person who actually owns the property is not going to come around and uh, you know check on it every once in a while. <coughs> after after 10 years, it's yours. You can make improvements, all that all that good stuff. Make it make it your home. That's that's when it, that's when it's okay. Um, I actually uh, haven't encountered very uh, many cases, at least in the Bronx, where there there are uh, a lot of abandoned buildings where you know people have gotten uh, caught uh, or or have have actually approved those buildings. But uh, I'm sure it does happen now. It happened more so in the uh, late '80s and '90s, right? Um, in, in the East Village, there are a lot of uh, homes down there, uh, co-ops or groups of people who, who've uh, squatted those buildings and improved them and brought them up and now they're 
they're they're selling them for uh, who knows how much. It's as much as it costs to live down there in the village, of course. And from what I understand, Con Ed will send you a bill if you just call them and say, "This is my address." Uh, yeah. It's not like <laughs> other like the other people who say, "Well, I need to see a, a lease, or I need to see this, or I need to see that." If you call, you you have a good shot of getting them to send the bill to an address in your name. It's a good start. Yeah. You want it, as much documentation as you as you can get. Yes. You, you with the straight hair? Um, I just want to know what um, a weapon is being Like, what does that mean? Like, what, what's a weapon? Perhaps she plays the musical song. <laughs> So, so poi, flame, flaming f things that you're twirling in the air. Could that be a weapon? That is a weapon. Okay, so I'm going to read you the definition of a uh, weapon, or this is criminal, criminal possession of a weapon in the fourth degree. Um, so included in that, um, uh, if you possess uh, any weapon, uh, any firearm, electronic dart gun, electronic stun gun, gravity knife, that's the knife where uh, you use centrifugal force to open up the, you know, flicks open, um, switchblade knife, pillum, ballistic knife, metal knuckle knife, cane, sword, billy, blackjack, bludgeon, uh, plastic knuckles, metal knuckles, chuck a stick, uh, sandbag, sand club, wrist brace type, slingshot, sling, uh, slung shot, shuriken, uh, kung fu star. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the general rule of thumb is if they can use it against you, they're going to. Um, the whole thing of the criminal central weapon and having the centrifugal force for the knife is something that's actually litigated because if you have a knife long enough, you'll be able to go like that, it'll pop, even though it's not designed that way. And I've had people where cops come up to them on the street and go, what do you got in your pocket? Oh, it's nothing, it's, it's a work tool. He goes, well, can you open it? And the guy's like, um, you know, let me see. And the cop goes four times like this, and the guy's like, let me show you how it works. And that's it. Now, it's in public, it's open, and you're under arrest. And that's happened more than once to people I know. So if a cop comes up to you and says, what do you have in your pocket? You want to answer, am I free to leave? I choose not to answer you and, and walk on by. So, so fire, like throwing fire. I mean, if you have poi things, you know, if they're on fire, I would say that's not a grand idea when the police arrive. If they're not on fire, I'm going to guess they don't know what the hell they are. And you in the, in the back. privately owned public spaces? As we call the pop space, we are in ongoing litigation with the city of New York. There's a case filed called Rodriguez v. Winsky. Rodriguez being city council member Adonis Rodriguez, and Winsky being deputy inspector Edward Winsky, who was the villain of Occupy. Uh, and uh, among the other defendants are J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, Brookfield Properties, and Mitsui Fudasan. These are all building owners with privately owned public space that tried to restrict access. And so, it's, I can talk, I could go on about this for quite a while. There's there's no great answer right now. I mean, right now, if you go down to where Zakati Park is, right, that's still open, you can go in there. Walk one block west from there, one block east from there, is the J.P. Morgan Chase building. That has been closed off, that plaza has been closed since a month before Occupy, because they knew what was happening. It was on Occupy's radar. And so they didn't want them to come there and camp out. They closed it off. It's been closed off since then. We're in, in suit against them trying to say this is wrong. They've now answered that we existed before POPs. POPs came about sort of because of what we were. And therefore, we're, this is our plaza. It's not a public plaza. If we choose to open it, we're, we can. And we've used facts and a very basic breach of contract claim and David Rockefeller, who was the president of J.P. Morgan when this happened, and when they got the zoning to go very high and very big, closed Cedar Street in a block in order to be in the middle of two blocks, really, and he said at the grand opening, it's great to have this public plaza for all the people of New York. 
that, that doesn't mean it's public. Like, it, it's infuriating. But right now, the idea of privately owned public space is a really interesting one. It's being litigated in the courts. Yeah. And I guess just to follow up, is, is it being litigated like at the federal level? Where in the courts is it check, litigated? Check, it, check in afterwards. Oh, OK. In the back there? A uh, rather narrow focus question, but uh, some of our friends are lawyers, and we've talked about potential shenanigans. Is there any particular trouble that they can get into? You, you, can your what kind of trouble can your lawyer friends get into if yeah. they get into shenanigans? Yeah, like, yeah. If, if they get far, like professional professional problems from misdemeanors, and probably not felonies, but well, if if they're working for themselves, not really. I mean, they, they could go up a. Uh, I mean, if, it, if it's depending on the shenanigan they're caught doing, I really love using that word, right? Any felony conviction is an automatic disbarment for a lawyer. So those are no-nos. Apparently, seven years later, you can get reinstated, I recently found out. Uh, for misdemeanors, that's more of a problem if you're working for a firm. And they're going to look poorly upon you being arrested for being somewhere you're not supposed to be. If you're Patricia or myself and you work for yourselves, and you're self-employed, then you know, you'll have to look at yourself in the mirror and deal with that. For me, I'm always risk averse about getting arrested because I don't want to be in the jail cell going through the system with all the court officers and the judges I spent 20 years building a reputation with and then appear before them. Uh, I would be incredibly embarrassed, but that would really be all. Right, and you don't want your lawyer friends to come with you anyway because they'll get you out. <laughs> <laughs> Jump in there with a follow-up question. Um, what is the difference in liability between, uh, between the organizer of an event and any potential guests? Um, and are there any people who, as an organizer, you should encourage not to come, besides your lawyer friends, to get you out of jail because it might be there might be heightened risk for them of any enforcement action? I think that, as far as, as I said, for Reverend Billy, he got you know they, they did this whole thing. They leave, they hang out for 20 minutes, and the video of the encounter with the police, they're like, we want to speak to him. And his wife and the leader of the party goes, no, I'm in charge here. And everyone else is stepping up and he's stepping back. No, we want him. So it's sort of like, if there's a leader, sometimes that helps, because if the police need to make an arrest, all right, let's just grab this one, everyone else get out of here. So as far as somebody being there that shouldn't be there, that's risk averse, I mean, anyone has an outstanding warrant, open criminal cases, you know, criminal history where this might be more severe for them than someone else. They are, they owe child support, they don't have any identification on them, they may have immigration consequences. I mean, it goes from different levels. I mean, I don't perceive, depending on the height of the shenanigan, immigration consequences, but, you know, if it's climbing the Brooklyn Bridge and you're charged with reckless endangerment, that could be considered a violent crime and maybe would impact the immigration status. And so you're saying that basically the police have wide discretion in deciding whether to just arrest a leader or arrest everybody, sort of up to what they feel like. Yeah, definitely it's their win. You hear in the beard. <laughs> um, what, what evidence is required to convict uh, on trespassing? Um, I mean, obviously an officer being there and having testimony about arresting you, but what about sort of artifacts after the fact, photographs, uh, writing, that, that sort of stuff? Are you, are you referring more towards uh, if you were to take pictures of what, what happened and then post them up on the web somewhere and then... And then well, to make, it, to make a distinction, one photograph of you in the space, uh, but also a photograph that you took in the space that can be linked to you in some way. Um, here, well, here, let me actually repeat that, and this is a question that I'm very interested in too. What sort of trouble <laughs> can you get into after the fact when maybe you have done something or maybe you were very good at Photoshop? But maybe you did something, and uh, you took some pictures of it, and then they're on the internet, and they're all over the place. Because this has happened once or twice recently that someone has been arrested for someone painted a um, "Will you marry me?" Uh, sign graffiti, a graffiti on a empty billboard, and that story appeared in the paper. It was uh, really lovely and romantic, and his girlfriend said yes, and he was arrested. <laughs> really makes the story fun. Um, <laughs> It's actually interesting. In New York City, you cannot be arrested for a violation, an offense, if the police 
don't see you do it. You can only be arrested for a misdemeanor if the police don't see you do it, if there's a complaining witness or other evidence. So in the Reverend Billy situation, the way we won that case, he was clearly had committed the offense of, uh, of trespass. He had, he had gone into a public space. They had said leave. He hadn't left quick enough, so therefore he had been guilty of that trespass three, the violation. However, the police charged him with the higher trespass, the criminal trespass, and that's why we were able to win, saying that you're really only doing that because you couldn't arrest him otherwise, but you didn't have that. So in these situations, depending on the level, like, you know, I think if they're going up to a billboard and painting a billboard, I'm not sure that he's going to get arrested for a trespass as much as he might be for you know, graffiti or I don't know other. what exactly he was charged with, but in this case, is it likely that the evidence was there was a giant billboard? And, was, and a quote from him saying, I asked my group fiance to marry me by climbing up this thing and painting a giant bit. I mean, you can put yourself out there and get yourself into trouble. One of the things that happened with some of the critical mass stuff that I was involved with in the past, uh, if everyone remembers the kid who got knocked off the bike in Times Square, so that happened on a Friday. On Sunday night, I was watching the video with the guy he, who had gotten hold of it and on the phone with the kid who got knocked off the bike. Because the criminal defense lawyer in me will say, don't post anything. But the activist lawyer in me will say, well, sometimes you've got to take a little bit of risk to get the story out. And so I'm on the phone watching this, and they're trying to decide, can this hurt his case? Can it hurt his criminal case? Can he be convicted of something based on this? And that's regular. I mean, in that situation, obviously, we posted it. He, he was charged with dropped against him. The officer was eventually charged and you know, brought to trial. Convicted and then all charges were sort of dropped. Uh, but you're, you're more you're more likely to be arrested after the fact if you're entering into a dwelling uh, where you know there's a complainant or somebody says, okay, well this person you know, broke into my home. I have I have the picture proof. But if it's out in the public area, why lose right? So a landlord would have to get involved and say like, oh, I saw a picture of you inside my building. I don't like that. And complain to the police. Right. Would that be enough? A landlord or someone who um, has the authority to uh, exclude another person from that from that building. And so what would happen in public spaces? Who would have the right to say, I saw a picture of someone trespassing in a public building? Um, if, if you were to, no, yeah, if the, if the officer didn't see it, then, then no, then they, they wouldn't no, Depending, say it's a, a, a public park. Right? You're not supposed to be in a public park after dark. Um, I don't know if that rises to a misdemeanor or just a violation. Obviously, if it rises to a misdemeanor and you guys post pictures at the Bethesda Fountain at 2 a.m., if that is a Class A misdemeanor, the police could ostensibly arrest you for it. If it's a violation, they could not. It is the prosecution's burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. So they have to, if, if somebody said, hey, well, we saw this person in the plaza at 2 a.m., you'd have to prove that that picture was taken at 2 a.m. So if you're going to volunteer that information, that's probably not a good idea. So um, let's see, how about uh, you right here? Um, what happens if you enter a public park at a certain time, and then you stay there longer, and you haven't checked your phone, you haven't checked your time, and you don't know what time it is, and the police come in and say, So being, being bad at keeping time or not knowing what time it well, is. Well, you, you would have that defense of not knowingly remaining in the space. You know, in the case that you're handling, there's video, and it's a really interesting case, which was just defending some veterans who were arrested at a war memorial down by Wall Street after 10 p.m. for reading the names of those who were killed in wars. And uh, you know, it was sort of a protest to have done it. It came, the time came for them to have to have left. And I think that it wasn't, they, they didn't know what time it was because the police made a dozen announcements. Please leave, please leave, it's this time. And you know, reading off of a piece of paper the exact wording of the order they have to give before they can make the arrest. But those people, I don't know, but I don't imagine they're just being charged with trespass as much as disorderly conduct for uh, disregarding correct. a lawful order to disperse. That's correct. Uh, but they usually do have the signs posted, so uh, they should be posted signs at each entrance to the park. 
Um, so in that sense, you've been given notice. Just because you didn't actually read the sign, it doesn't mean that uh, you haven't been given notice. And if you prove notice uh, in the prosecution's case, um, as well as the fact that you you, you entered and, and remained unlawfully, uh, then they can they can charge you with that, and, and you can't be you could be convicted. You're next. Back, back to the weapon question. You used a crowbar to get into some space. Let, let's say it's not someone's home. Let's yes. say it's an abandoned space. But you used a crowbar to get in, and you're carrying the crowbar around. Don't carry it around. <laughs> I mean, leave the crowbar somewhere, not quite visible, and maybe pick it up on the way out once you're outside. But, you know, don't carry it around. I mean, it, 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 do, put yourself in the best possible position. And uh, yeah. It's like way pretty well into what's the distinction between breaking and entering and trespassing? What's the distinction between breaking and entering and trespassing? And breaking and entering is not a crime, right? Trespass is, is actually part of the penal law. Breaking and entering is more of like common parlance from TV. You know, maybe at one point it was parlance from the police, but at this point, you know, you could be convicted of burglary depending on how how you're doing it, even if you're not necessarily taking something, but that's sort of like another, I think, offense level up from trespass. Right, but burglary is, is uh, unlawfully entering or in, and remaining in, in a dwelling uh, with an intent to commit a crime therein. So if you push your way into someone's house, but then just kind of stood there, then that's, that you can, you can argue that's just trespass, but then if you did something like, I don't know, slap, Someone, then that's, that's, that's a crime there, and you could be charged charged with the burglary. But there's no, yeah, there's really no breaking and entering. Right, so say, say you decide to go into an abandoned subway tunnel underneath the ground somewhere in Brooklyn, uh, and that you you had told everybody, we're gonna, everyone who comes in is gonna go home with a piece of New York City subway brick or this or that. Perhaps then you can get charged with burglary because now you're entering unlawfully and you have the intent of taking something that doesn't belong to you. Actually, um, that's that's uh, burglary is for dwellings, not not necessarily city Correct. property. So. You're safe. You can steal the subway tiles. <laughs> is there a distinction between, let's say, climbing a fence to get onto to, to trespass versus, let's say, taking a bolt cutter and cutting a lock to get on? Is there a distinction between? Climbing over something like a fence to get into a property and using a tool like a, a bolt cutter to cut a lock open and get into something. Well, the effect is the same. You're you're gaining entry. Um, what what you're describing is uh, it, it would just tack on an, an additional charge, like a, a, some sort of vandalism type charge for, right, for destroying the gate. Right, and you're more likely that if you're caught, you'll also be responsible for a cost, a restitution cost for the repair. Uh, well. Something sort of related to that, um, with with entering building, um, is there, like, in, in reference, not a dwelling, say, abandoned industrial building where it's not, there aren't signs up and there's a way into the building that doesn't require you, like, breaking something, like an open window, an open door, hole in the side of the building, even, um, where does that line fall? Like, you know, where where does it become trespassing if it's something that's just derelict? But you know, yeah, broken fences, open windows, that kind of thing. Like, it's in disrepair. Derelict things in disrepair. Let's say you're wandering around and you happen crawl to crawl through a hole. Through, like, is there a, a difference? You know, walking through a door, and crawling through a hole. I mean, you you have a couple of thoughts here, right? One is, are you going to be arrested? And again. I'd say you have a pretty good argument not to be arrested, and if the officer comes upon you, I, it was wide open, officer, I had no idea. Oh, sure, I crawled through that tiny hole to get in, but that can, you know, so perhaps you can convince the officer that you didn't know, or perhaps you convince the judge or jury that you didn't knowingly come into a place. Obviously, if you enter there and someone says, you're not allowed to be in here, and you say, it doesn't say that, I'm staying, well, now you've been told, and now you're remaining unlawfully. Uh, let's see, we got here. I have a question. If you're, um, if you're in a building and you see, you see cops coming from like a mile away and 
we yeah. have like a really good opportunity to kind of just play dumb and just wander accidentally into some other room where you totally wouldn't come across them. Does that like make matters much worse to try to make an attempt like that? So you see cops coming and you have the opportunity to play dumb or sort of wander off or something. <laughs> Like in the building, though. Like, like, but, okay, you, you don't leave the premises, but you, you know. You so in your scenario, the cops have already spotted you. They haven't seen you, but they know that someone is in the building. You know how do you make it worse? Does how do you make it worse? Okay. You know, it only makes it worse if you're caught. <laughs> you know, if, if you can hide in a manner that will not get you caught, I, of course, won't tell you how to evade the police. I would never advise you to break the law. But, you know, I would if I think you can do something and disappear, like I'm saying, if you see them coming, I would leave. I would get out the back door and I'd be down the street before they come anywhere. And then I'd say, that wasn't me. That was the other dad. So uh, my question is uh, kind of related to the earlier question. Um, you are in a place where you shouldn't be, and not the police come upon you, but a security guard comes upon you and asks you to stick around. I call the cops, don't go. What obligation do you have to stay if he's threatened that he's already called the cops? What obligation do you have to security guards and you know someone who might come across you somewhere who's not a cop, but is a security guard, and says, you have to stay here, I'm, the cops are coming. Well, it's his responsibility to keep you there. So that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> it's his responsibility to keep you there and, and, and wait, wait for the cops. You know, they, they have, there is authority for private security to arrest citizens. And there's, you know, you've seen people who are shoplifting who could be detained. However, if that's done improperly, that corporation can be sued for that. Um, and in this scenario, if that's done improperly, or if there's four of you, and he's not big enough to stand in the only doorway. <laughs> but, but what authority, can I follow up on that? But what, what authority, what force can they use? What authority, what force can they use? I mean, it's, it's, also, it's a fact specific question that in the moment, are you gonna be able to convince him that he's wrong? I hear you, you're, you're telling me to stay, but you're not allowed to touch me if I try and leave. I mean, I think if this guy's a private security guard, he's either doesn't care, so he's not gonna tell you to stay, but if he's now called the cops and wants you to stay, he's gonna play sheriff, right? He's gonna play marshal and try and keep you there. So, does he have the right to, to tackle you and beat you? Probably not. But is that gonna stop him from doing it if you challenge him? Probably not. <laughs> Hi, thank you both, first of all, for um, answering our questions. Um, I have a question about surveillance uh, in trespassing. What do you guys have to say about surveillance cameras? Is there a registry we can go to check for them? If, what should we do to look for them? What can we do if we want to block them out, et cetera? We want to know all about security cameras. Yeah. So there's no like matrix network <laughs> of, of cameras all tied to one database where they can they can you know do some kind of facial recognition and, and find you. Um, every every private building uh, has its own uh, surveillance system, which uh, the district attorney can subpoena. Even the defense attorney can subpoena uh, to you know make sure that that's actually uh, so they can view it to make sure that's actually you or whomever they're they're trying to look for. Um, you know, we have in our in our practice obtained security video. Usually, it's either to to convince that our client didn't do it, or to help when he's been unlawfully arrested and we have some good video. It's always horrible the actual video. You know, it's never really crisp, clean HD video like Taru video, like the police video is when they're out in the streets. When it's sort of set video, it usually takes a shot every second. You get it, it only runs on Windows PC. It's really not great. Now, if someone was to sort of put up a list of all the, all the public and private cameras all throughout, I imagine they could be charged with obstruction of governmental administration of justice, which is a class A misdemeanor. I actually have uh, something helpful to say to that, which is that you can train yourself to look for security cameras and train yourself to determine not 
100% accurately, but pretty closely, which cameras have people watching them and which cameras don't. Because most cameras uh, are not actively being watched, which means that if there's cause later on for someone to go and take a look at a recording, they might do so, but in the moment, most cameras are not being actively looked at. You can train yourself uh, to determine which is which. Come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Related to the one that to the thing she said about camera, well, one I think there is uh, some some groups that, that yeah. do index cameras like publicly. I know there's a group that does uh, security camera walking tours of Lower Manhattan. You can find it on the web. I don't remember their name, but um, the other thing was, what's the deal with the NYPD cameras? Are those actively watched? Do they have facial recognition software? What's the NYPD cameras? What's the deal? What's the story with those? So, so in, in some housing uh, project areas, they have. Uh, Nest. Oh, um, I mean, there's one on the corner of my block. Like, it's two cameras. It's oh, up on a light pole. Oh, you need one of those. The oh, okay. Um, uh, there, there is a um, uh, a central place where the where, where somebody is just in a room with with a little toggle switch and you know looking. And sometimes they miss things. Sometimes they they uh, they do catch uh, crimes in action. So. Those are generally live monitored, like, I mean, right. yes. Usually, yeah, there the, usually is someone, the, someone the looking, NYPD but there's, is just, watching. there's yeah. so many, yeah. so many but views that they're, they're looking at, they're, it's, it's, and it's only one guy, so it's, it's kind of difficult for them to actually catch something. How's everybody doing? We're, we're now starting to go over time, but people, you, you seem pretty good. How are you guys doing? Great. Great. I'm good. good. Well, let's How's take a few more questions. It, it looks like we got lots more questions here. Jennifer. Uh, Something that I've learned through past transgressions. Uh, keep your hands out of your pocket. I was wondering if there's any other super basic red flag issue that when you're dealing with that. What? It's just a habit of mine, and I got it. It's not. The question is, when you're when you're in a situation where you're initially being confronted or pressured by a cop, are there any particular habits that you should have? Or you know, this gentleman says. His habit is to keep his hands in his pockets, and that was not a smart idea. Well, just uh, some basic advice. Um, try not to have any uh, bulges. <laughs> you know, besides the obvious ones, but you know, uh, like a wallet, something, something that's not so obvious. Um, uh, so DeBoer, who I was mentioning before, had a big bulge in his uh, in his back, um, uh, underneath his jacket. So when the officer saw that, then you know. That's something he automatically uh, registered as, as being a weapon. Um, when you do encounter the police, uh, don't turn around and walk the other way. Uh, just keep going about your business. If you, if you, uh, a lot of officers make arrests uh, based on, oh, well, this person made a furtive movement. Um, for, first off, can somebody take the time to get me an absent while I'm up here? Thank you. Um, I talk a lot to people about what to do in that police encounter. And, you know, I think there's a great art to it. I think that if you are an individual that knows how to encounter people and through all different types of folks can keep them at ease, can keep them comfortable, that's, that's the goal. I, the, to quote Aretha Franklin, R-A-S-P-E-C-T, you know, give the, give the cop as much respect as you possibly can. You know, Absolutely. He is, you know, say it's in a dark space. He doesn't know what else is around him. He doesn't know what you're about to do. He doesn't know any other people are around. So you want to make him feel comfortable that you're just a kid hanging out. You're not a criminal involved in a criminal situation that he has to be fearful of. But you want to respect him because, again, he holds the next 24 hours of your life in his hands. He can make it miserable for you. He can put handcuffs on you that are going to hurt and give you tingles in your fingers for six months, he can let you walk home in that moment. You know, So when you're encountering the officer, I mean, it's different when I encounter an officer in a suit as when I encounter an officer in my shorts on the weekend. You know, I if I see an officer on the street, no matter what I'm wearing, I usually nod or say hi, ask them how they're doing, not stop and chat with them, but like, good morning, officer, good afternoon, officer, you know, how you doing, guys? Just to try and show comfort and confidence in Give them something to feel positive about. You know, I'd say that 
there are many really, really good people in the police department. I sue them for a living. So there are some bad apples. Those are the guys I'm going after. And unfortunately, the supervisors are sometimes the bad apples, and it trickles down. So I'm trying to get these guys either retrained or out of it so that they don't influence the next generation of guys in blue. But when you're there and you're dealing with them, show them respect. Show them that you're comfortable. Show them that they have nothing to fear from you. Let's say one or two more. Uh, back there in the purple. Wait, did you already ask a question? Yeah. Um, Wait, let someone else. Um, you already asked a question, correct? Um, this is kind of backtracking a little bit. Do sealed records show up? And how, do they affect things? You're, say, you're talking about sealed juvenile records? Yes. That is not supposed to count against you Ever. at all. But the keyword is supposed to. It's, it's not supposed to, but I've definitely been in conversation with district attorneys where they've said, well, he's got this thing from when he was 16. And I'm like, I don't know what you could possibly be seeing because that doesn't exist. But, you know, it's been raised and it shouldn't be. So. You know, it's something that, does it change it from being absolutely clean to possibly absolutely clean? It could. You know, it's going to depend on the DA and, you know, sometimes it's a low level offense. They're going to give it to the youngest DA. And if that guy's looking for a trial, looking to really, you know, push things around, they're going to be excited. If that person is at the very end of his first year and he's moving up to the misdemeanor or the felony level, he doesn't care about it. He's going to make a deal and get it over with. Maybe one more question. Is there anyone who hasn't asked a question already? Right here. I think this question is not part of this panel, but you're welcome to stick around and chat afterwards. Um, unless you're talking about using your car and, you know, for trespass shenanigans. Yeah, it's your, you know, you trespass and you don't know if it's you and your car or anything. So you... Like, isn't that trespassing if they are going to be looking for Are you car? more protected well, if, in your car? If you if trespass you... with your car onto someone else's property and you're arrested, is, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, are they able to, like, look for your car as well or just... Well, if, it, if it's just if it's just you and, and whoever you're getting arrested with, they mm -hmm. will uh, they will do an inventory search of your car. Uh, it's, okay. they're, 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 they're supposed to keep this is all stuff for safekeeping. So your your car can be searched, but in terms of um, uh, trespass to your your personal property, that that, that, that doesn't really apply. I think one of the first things I explained was that one of the exceptions to trespass is legal justification when a, a, law, a law officer has the right to search your things for a specific reason, whether it's an emergency or whether you're being safe, you know, they're taking it as inventory and they need to safeguard it, or they think that you're involved in a crime and they want to see what else you have on you. Your, your rights to privacy are greatly diminished. And your canoe. And your canoe. You have a greater right to privacy on your person than in your canoe. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's it. But you're all welcome to stick around for a bit and uh, hang around the bar. And you know, we'll be here to answer a few more questions and stick around and chat. Um, Let's have a hand for these people and their great. Next week, next Tuesday, we have a really great ta talk. In fact, it's almost sold out, so uh, if you'd like to come back, it's going to be really crazy. We've uh, got uh, site-specific experience design, and we've got really great speakers coming for that. So come back next week, same time, same place. Thank you all so much for coming out.